Okay. Uh, this piece is called uh, um, Ice Delivery Day. This is me when I was two years old. It's about 1940. They, we used to get the ice in the, in the ice box and the man would put it in. And if, when it melted into this dish down here, which took a couple of days, um, my, I would tell my mother when it was full. Um, we lived in the, in the other places had electric refrigerators and electric stoves, but there wasn't in places like where we lived because we had had the depression and then we had the war and all, there were no more refrigerators or stoves made during the war because everything went for the war effort. Uh, and everybody talked about the war all the time. And that says this, this paper says war. And I can remember my parents just talking about the war and the price of meat when we were eating. So this was uh, me at two years old. This is first day of school for me. Now, COVID-19 has not been my, my first quarantine time. When I was a child, uh, my mother feared polio very much. And so I had never, I didn't know any people except for immediate family and immediate neighbors. And I had to go to school when I was five years old. And I had a teacher who was very large. And she had a very loud voice, and she frightened me. And <laughs> I was very frightened of her. And the poor soul, I know now she was just a sweet, kind lady, but they made all women that were heavy set in those days had to wear these corsets that made them look like they were poured into a sewer tile. And I was very little, and I had a disease that I couldn't digest my food until after I'd had my tonsils out when it didn't happen until I was six. So this lady had this huge bosom and I was very little and when I would look up at her I could only see the top half of her face with this noose of of uh, beads hanging over her bosom and she scared me and she tried to comfort me and I vomited all over her black crepe dress. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's how the, the polio pandemic <laughs> affected my first day of school. <laughs> when I was um, very little, and my father was still living, and um, my brother. My older brother wanted to give my sister and I a rabbit. He was going out of the rabbit business. And my father did not like the messiness of pets. But he said, well, we could have a rabbit if it was just one rabbit. And it was a male rabbit. And we named him Fuzzy. And we liked to play with Fuzzy a lot. And we would get him out of his cage and play with him. Well, uh, we forgot him one day and he, he left and we were absolutely fractured. We, uh, Fuzzy's gone, Fuzzy's gone. Well, you know, he's a big white rabbit. So my, my parents just assumed that, you know, the predators had eaten him. So, uh, we cried and cried and our father says, all right, he would buy us another rabbit. But, my brother was already out of the rabbit business. So we got, we went to another rabbit place, and, but I liked the black one and my sister liked the spotted one. But my father said he had been very firm. One rabbit, he said, one rabbit. But you know, he was putty in our hands. And so we got two rabbits because they were both females. So, so. So they were fixing the cage to put the girl bunnies in, and here come Fuzzy up over the hill. So my, 
my my parents said, oh, my, you know, and then said, well, you never let Fuzzy play with the girl bunnies because he might hurt them. Well, we like to play with the bunnies and we got them out and we felt so sorry for Fuzzy because he really uh, wanted to play too. Why should we leave him in there all by himself and we're much bigger than him and we're not gonna let him hurt the girl bunnies. So we just brought him out and then we happily put them all back into their cages and reported to our parents that Fuzzy did not hurt the girl bunnies. He just wanted to play leapfrog with them. <laughs> So, so there, there is that story about my childhood. This is called The Young Are Taught to Hunt and Gather. And that's my sister and I in a creek, which my mother would take us berry picking. And we had tiny, tiny little baskets. And she had a big water bucket that she put hers in. But we always said we got we picked more more baskets than our mother. <laughs> so we would play in the creek and collect minnows and play with the crawdads. And this is my mother, he's picking berries. And these are berry vines. And it's hard for anybody to see because you have to look down very close. But there is a red-winged blackbird. There is a snake down in there. There is a little rabbit. There is um, a frog. Um, there is a robin. Uh, there is my mother reaching back in to find the big fat berries that are back in there. And there's a bird nest with little robin eggs in it. Um, and there's the fence that everything grows against. So there is how it looks. And this was an important part of my childhood. This one's called feasting season. This is my mother and my sister and me in a cutaway of pretty much what our kitchen looked like. We had a pot belly stove that we always had hot water on top of. We'd heat with wood and coal for overnight. And it, we did not have a lot of money, but we, I never felt poor because I was never hungry. Uh, I, I always had a nice warm place to sleep and everything that I needed. So here we are, this is, we're having cornbread and beans for supper, and we have potatoes and squash and pumpkins, and my mother baked all the time. She baked the berries that we picked in the summertime, and we had fruit uh, that we kept. We had a root cellar. So this was our feasting season. This is one of my Christmas pieces that I decided to put in here because it tells a story about me. This is called Helping the Helpers. My mother never wanted us to feel poor. So we always, whenever we went to town on Saturdays, we would go to town on the bus because we didn't have a car. And at Christmas season, she always made sure we had pennies in our pockets because every time we seen Salvation Army, we always put money in, in the pot because uh, we were not the poor people. We were the people that helped the poor people. So we always, and the Salvation Army always had bands then, and they were usually not very good music, but they were loud. <laughs> the, all the instruments were kind of mismatched that they had then. So there's my mom. She had that same coat most of the Time my whole childhood. My mother was redheaded and always wore uh, blue or green scarves. There's me in my red suit, my sister in her blue one. So that was one of the things we always did at Christmas time. This is Happy Fools. 
When we were teenagers, my sister and I used to go down to southeastern Ohio and visit with our aunt, where she pretty much didn't watch us. It kind of made my mother crazy if she knew how much freedom we did have there. And there was a boy down there named uh, Joe. And Joe just was very happy to have two two uh, girls in interested in him. <laughs> and Joe had a bicycle, but it didn't have good tires. And there's a lot of hills in that country. So he kind of made tires by with a lot of rope and um, duct tape. And the bicycle didn't have any brakes. So we would get up at the top of the hill and we would go let gravity take us down. And at the bottom of the hill, there was a sharp curve in the road, but there was a sandy bottom creek there. So we would get up the top of the hill, my sister in the handlebars, me behind Joe, and we would go sailing down and wipe out in the sand at the bottom of the creek. And that's why this is called Happy Fools. <laughs> this one is called, Do You Work or Are You Just a Housewife? <laughs> so, there's pregnant me carrying about 50 pounds of wet clothes with a two-year-old pulling on my shirt tail and a five-year-old playing in the rinse water of the wringer washer. And there's my dog, Missy, and the little pile of dirty clothes and the soap and the buckets that you had to carry the water back and forth. And yes, I worked, but I just didn't get paid. All right, this is just called Halloween pumpkins. I grew a big garden and a lot of pumpkins, and this is why I grew them, because my kids and the neighborhood kids like to make jack-o'-lanterns. <laughs> um, so here we are, everybody making jack-o'-lanterns, and there's my dog, Missy, who was always with us Sam. There's my daughter and the pumpkins and trick-or-treat bags and the the mask and the cape and the black cat gonna fall into that pumpkin right there. And my oldest son got his done, he's leaving. Helping the youngest one pull out the pumpkin guts. So, there we are. That was part of my life at that time. This one is called, oh, he won't be any trouble. I still had a, a young son. He was my youngest, who's about four. And I had a sweet lady friend who knew I liked to sew. And she had a quilters group. And, you know, she didn't have any children. So she invited me to come and quilt with the quilters group. And I said, oh no. I said, I would love to, but I still had a child at home and, and that I couldn't come. She said, oh, bring him. She said, he won't be any trouble. Well, he didn't go because I knew how much trouble he would be. But I made this piece because I was imagining how they would look because this lady's everything in her house was lavender, pink, and white. And how it would, how, horrified these ladies would be if I did show up with my four-year-old who had a bouncy ball and a chocolate ice cream cone. <laughs> Here's a lady has got their, all their scissors in, in the white cat and everything. Yes, it would have been a disaster and they would have been horrified. <laughs> okay. This is called, The Holidays Are Brought to You by Mom. <laughs> Here is me fixing Thanksgiving dinner. All the holidays are always brought to you by Mom. Thank you very much. There are the pies. Every, the pies are done. Everybody's interested in the pies. 
Nobody's interested in the dirty dishes that are in the sink. Uh, nobody is interested in doing anything about the baby who's putting the dog's food on his head or emptying the waste basket or cleaning up the mixer and the eggs and the cat is going to do that. So this is just kind of what it was like fixing Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner. So I just think moms don't really get enough credit for what they do on holidays. So. This is called um, Hard Row Broken Hoe because life wasn't always real happy. <laughs> Sometimes it was pretty doggone scary. And no matter how hard to row, I kept hoeing, but sometimes the bro hoe broke. So <laughs> metaphorically and literally. So all you could do was put a splint on hoe and keep going. Life was pretty scary a lot of times. There's the wind blowing the corn and everything, but got to keep going. This is called, you can't wait for the right time. I have had a busy life, but all I ever really, really wanted to be was an artist. And I've been an artist in spite of all the other things I had to be. But here I am, got my, this, this is the way it was, had my easel set up. I learned to paint in acrylics and not, not oil because Oil dries too slow, and when the kids knock the canvas off of the easel, it, it smears, but not with acrylic. So here I am, painting in spite of anything, and there is my middle son, who still likes to read books, who's sitting on the floor, my youngest one, who always wanted lots of attention, and my two oldest ones tearing each other's hair out. And we had the cat and the dog and the toys and, and the noise, but the rule was don't touch mom's art supplies and don't touch her right elbow. So, but I kept going anyways. So. This piece is called Life Goes Around and Around. Here you are, young couple. He buys her an ice cream cone, and she's interested, and a teddy bear. Then you have the pregnant lady. Then you get on the merry-go-round and go round and around and around, raising your kids, and up and down, and then you're a grandparent. And then you're a grandparent, and you start all over. And here you've bought all these goodies for your grandchildren, but they still want you to buy them some more. <laughs> so that's how life goes around and around. This is self-portrait. So, you know, um, there, there I am. There's old chubby me, and this, and there's chubby me in the mirror. And there's nice slender me on the canvas. <laughs> My cat is wondering, you know, she's say, who do you think you're kidding? So that's my self-portrait. Okay, this piece is called Lonely is Half, but Solitude is Whole. I get uh, feeling lonely sometimes thinking I, I wish I had somebody to camp with or spend some time with. And then I thought of the possibilities and then I decided I was probably better off by myself. And so that's why I say lonely is half. So I decided not to be lonely. I would just enjoy my solitude. Okay, so I finally got all my kids raised and 
I, as a single lady, I would go out Sunday mornings for breakfast, and in the restaurant, I would frequently see these dads bringing their kids in, and I knew they, they were divorced dads that had their kids for the day, and it really made me grit my teeth to see these kids on the verge of death while he is oogling the large busted waitress. <laughs> okay, this is called Default to Hell, because I had a boyfriend, more than one actually, that really kind of pooped out on me when I needed some help, and they told me all oh, their troubles. They just had such terrible troubles. Well, I figured, you know, they didn't really have terrible troubles. I had already lived through a lot of devils. And these are my devils. This one's dead. That one is wounded. And I am getting the hell out of hell. But the boyfriend is being drugged off to hell by his little adolescent devils. This is called the Democratic Luncheon. For years, I supported myself with my own house cleaning business. And this is when I lived in Akron, so it's nobody from around here, but I worked for a very wealthy lady, and I really preferred to get out of her house at lunchtime and just go and eat something in my car to get away from her because she followed me around. She was actually a very lonely person, but I just couldn't take her too much more, but she just begged me and begged me, please stay and have lunch in with her. Finally, I felt sorry for her, so I said, okie dokie, I would do that. So uh, she drug her very, very nice dining chair to the kitchen because she's a very democratic person. And she put a nice placemat down for herself and some uh, lobster thermidor and a very, she had a very nice lunch, and she pulled up a stool for me and got me a smooth peanut butter sandwich on white bread, which I hate white bread and smooth peanut butter, but that's what she gave me, be, and I thought, I am very democratic because I didn't bite her head off. So we were both being very democratic. <laughs> I'm a country woman, so if you notice, these, these chickens are all very alarmed, and they are all roosters. And it's plain to see what I'm about to do here. And uh, the, the title of this piece is Ending the Relationship. <laughs> there you are. I lived over a music store for 10 years that catered to bluegrass and folk musicians. And so I had a lot to do with uh, bluegrass and folk music at that time. And these were friends of mine. And when they're jamming, in order for their sound to blend well, they lean in towards each other. And I thought that was charming and fascinating and it does make them sound nice when they all lean in together and their voices all blend and these were friends these were these are friends of mine that were playing and i, I like the body english of all of them the way they bend in and to their instruments and everything banjo player kind of like that because banjos are heavy Okay, this is called Hot Stove Pickers. And I, I knew a lot of people like this, and I lived in a house with a stove like this. And there they are, just not a lot of money, but they're having a heck of a lot of fun jamming with each other. And they got their hot coffee, the stove's cooking, the dog's there. There's the pot in case anybody needs that. 
You can store the extra stuff under the bed. There is the jug in case you need that. Everybody having a good time? Just picking and grinning. They all knew the same songs. They're all friends of mine. And they lived a very humble life, which I had too. These are some friends of mine playing music. I, I dubbed them the underdogs because the place where they play is called the underdog. So of course I put them under a dog and used a little artist license to decorate up the back of the piano there with some morning glories. And they're just down there happily making their music, which is my favorite kind of music where people are just happily making it because they feel like it. This is some of the street musicians that I observed, oh, quite a few years ago on Yellow Spring Streets. And I can't remember their names. They were, I think most of them still around here, but they were a lot younger then. So just on the streets, just busking and all the kids dancing around them, being delightful. Just called street musicians. Love music. Okay, these I've been in New Orleans twice, once before uh, Katrina and after Katrina. And a lot of street musicians in New Orleans. So here's some of them. So, very colorful people, making really good music. Yes, a lot better than the Salvation Army Band was. <laughs> Back in the 50s and the 60s, a lot of people had these cookout things in their yard, these barbecues. I call them monuments to man cooking. So everybody used to have cookouts and the man of the house would burn some hot dogs and weenies and everybody gave him lots of applause. All the men were so impressed when he cooked his weenies on, on the fire. And meanwhile, the women brought all of this other stuff and they brought the salads and the corn and the chicken and the pies and the cakes and the jello molds. And here this little boy, he's very interested in that chocolate cake that that lady has right there. And the dog, the dog is, is impressed with what the man did too. And I don't know if you can see, there's two little kids down here looking out because that's where little kids learn things. They get down underneath the they get underneath the table and just be quiet and listen to all the moms and the aunts talk. <laughs> so that is King Cook. This this one is called the Butter and Egg Man. Now this is a story because women had no income on a farm, but they could usually, it was traditional for let them to have the money, but they got from selling butter and eggs. And, but they didn't sell butter and eggs to their neighbors. Their neighbors all had butter and eggs, but the dealer would come through to buy the butter and eggs because he sold them in the town. And it was a very, very big deal to the women when the butter and egg man came to town because he, um, he always had news of the outside world. And remember, they didn't have the radios. They didn't have newspapers. They didn't <coughs> have any um, news of their neighbors. 
And so the butter and egg man had all that news and he smelled good. He had a snazzy suit and he liked to charm the ladies and the ladies liked to be charmed. Now, the, the women, when they sold the butter and eggs, that they bought what the husband considered to be extras, which I expect this linoleum that's on the floor would have been extra that she would have bought to make her house a little fancier. And if she had children, she bought them shoes and books and paper so that they could go to school. That was considered extra by the farmer. Now here she, she has, this is her stove that she has to haul wood and, and feed the fire and know everything about in order to cook and take care of her home. And here she has water. Water is in the pails, and here you can you can get, there's a dipper there for you want to drink a water, and here's to dry your hands, and there's the water. Here if you want to wash, here's the dish pan for more water, and you heat the water over here on the stove. And so, but the farmers did not like the butter and egg man. So when the farmer seen the butter and egg man's rig out there, he came stomping into the house because it was not unknown for the ladies to leave with the butter and egg man or just get beguiled. And sometimes they uh, was beguiled enough to hand over some of the farmer's stuff. And But I look at it this way. When she married this farmer, she could choose from Farmer A or Farmer B, and she had to get married because didn't want to be a spinster in those days. So I think when the butter and egg man was charming her, I think that's nice because it's the first time she ever thought maybe she had another choice. So that's my butter and egg man piece. This is called Modern Woman. Now, she doesn't really need a computer. It's just that all of her friends tell her that she will have access to so many things if she would get a computer because she still has a, a telephone. Here she got a telephone and she's got a radio and she's got a good reading lamp and she's got her cats, but now she's got a computer too. So she's going to learn how to use a computer. So there she is. Now the cats have lacked since she's been into this, it's taken a lot of her time and the cats have lacked discipline. So you can see that they've made havoc with her yarn all over the place there. But there she is. There she is. There are multitudes of people like this out there since computers came in. <laughs> but she's a modern woman just because her telephone is old. <laughs> this is called running the batch. This is one of the things that people had to do in early America because people didn't have, um, they didn't have any anesthetic. They didn't have anything to, to kill germs with or anything. And life was rough. And sometimes you just needed a drink because life was rough. And so they made their own whiskey. Now, here's... The way they made it was they would, uh, ma uh, they had the mash in here, which is the um, grain, that is fermented grain. And then they could put it in here and put a little low fire under it. And the little low fire would evaporate the alcohol before it evaporates the, the wet part. And then it would go into this, this coil, this tube, into cold water, which would condense condense the alcohol, which would go into the pitcher, 
and then you can go pour it into the jars. Now, I had this in a show in Kentucky, and a very tall, handsome, older gentleman came and wanted to know, um, wanted me to tell him about this. And, and I told him all of that, and I said, and there are people that made their whiskey, made, made their whiskey for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. And when they came to this country, they still made it and they didn't see any reason why they should stop. And he said, no, ma'am, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but what he told me was, he said, you know what you got wrong? I said, what do I have wrong? He said, the sugar. He said, a lot of guys use that sugar, but he said, that sugar is what gives you the headache. He said, you make the, make your whiskey without the sugar. He said, it's pure, and it doesn't give you the headache like sugar does. Sugar just hurries it up. This is called anticipation and dreams. And one of the points of this piece is that Peacefulness is usually a fleeting thing. As you can see, she's peacefully having her tea and cookies, dreaming about springtime with her seed catalogs, and her gray kitty is sleeping, and her dog is sleeping, and the other cat is anticipating the bird. Now, you know, when the cat jumps for the bird, the bird cage is going to go over. It will knock over the plant stand, which will alarm the dog, which will make her spill her coffee and cookies. So peace is always a very brief thing. This piece is called Keeping Sharp. In the, in the days before these days, everybody had tools that they needed and they um, had to be sharpened all the time because having sharp tools was very important. And there was a lot of work to do for everybody in those days. There wasn't very much leisure time because when you wasn't working on some big job, you had to take care of these little jobs. So there he's got the ax that, he just pushed his little treadle, it made the wheel fly around. He's got the axe and the scythe and, and butcher knives and corn knives and all, all sorts of knives there that he has to keep sharp all the time. And, you know, this, this uh, stump right here was also used to dispatch the chickens when, when it was sun, time for Sunday dinner. But, Chickens aren't known for brightness. So this guy that's up there cock a doodle doing, he doesn't he doesn't realize where he's standing or why the axe is being sharpened. This is called Radio Days and Joe Lewis is winning. I am not a sports person. Just don't care for sports at all, one way or another. But I have always liked to watch sports people. I've watched, you know, watched them when they listened to the radio when I was a little kid, all swinging uh, really into the game, punching their fists around and jumping up and down and hallelujah when their guys is winning. And I had uncles and they were racist and my mother wasn't. And I witnessed them listening to a, a fight, a boxing match, on the radio, and they were cheering for the black guy. And I didn't understand that because I knew what they were like, and my mother warned me. And I said, why, why, why are they cheering for Joe Lewis? And he said, no, he, they hate the other guy more. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have done a number of African-American pieces. And I hope that people understand it's because I didn't have an easy life myself. And I do so much admire people that had it harder than I did and made it. These people are 
here is the family. Here is the, the, the men that probably work in a gas station or something, and they're listening, and they're excited and happy. And here's the, the youngsters, and maybe the deacon, and here's grandpa who used to be fatter, so his, his shirt's a little bit big on him now. And here's mom and little sister coming in from the kitchen to see what all the excitement's about. And I made this be the woman's, it's a men's event, but it's the woman's house. This is apple butter. And this was an annual thing. And none of these people are me. This is my aunts and my grandma and my cousin. Um, and it was a big, big deal. They would just, when apples were in season, they would get this big kettle. And when you had a copper kettle, that was good because when you're cooking the, the, um, the apple butter, it's got a lot of sugar in it. And it, it, if you don't keep stirring it, it burns. If you don't have, if you don't have a copper kettle, what you do is get hundreds and hundreds of pennies and put it in the bottom because they're copper. They were at that time. And so you keep stirring it and stirring it and stirring it. I don't anymore. I have an electric oven. I make it in there. So, but they did. That's what they did. And it was an all day job for the women. They would peel the apples and, and make the apple butter. And it was, you had to cook it a long time because apple butter is essentially, it's just apples, sugar, and spices. And you just have to cook it till it's thick enough to spread on bread. And it takes a long time. So it was a big, huge job. And I like apple butter, but I don't think, I don't know if I would have liked it enough to make it then. But then, you know, they couldn't really consider whether they liked it or not because it was a, it was food you could eat in the winter time that they could put up when they had it, and that's what they did. And I have a lot of admiration for the people that did all that. I know how to do it, and I'm glad I know how to do it, but I'm equally glad I don't have to. So. Hi, I'm Sharon Moeller. I'm the artist that did this work. Um, I've been doing it for since 1984. Okay. I've been an artist my whole life. I can't even remember not wanting to be an artist, but I'm self-taught. Um, my life didn't afford me opportunities to get other education. I did get some instruction on drawing, but I already had to be earning money as an artist before I could do that. Um, I uh, have had an interesting life, uh, and I always wanted to work three-dimensional, and I did a little wood carving, but it was painstakingly slow to me. So when I discovered at actually a bluegrass and folk festival in Pennsylvania, I discovered a girl who was working with this polymer clay stuff, which I had never heard of before. She was really making these delightful uh, little lapel pins that were just cartoons of whatever you wanted. She was just, they were three dimensional and they were charming. And I asked her about the polymer clay stuff, as she told me, but it took me three years to find it. Finally, I found it at Oberlin, in the bookstore at Oberlin, because I was out there with my girlfriend and her daughter. So I was off and running after I discovered Sculpey. And I had previously did a lot of work with uh, sculpting with wire. So all of my stuff still has very, there's nearly as much wire as there is clay in them. That is how I get very fine detail. 
because you couldn't do that with uh, regular clay because uh, the regular clay would burst if you had wires inside of it when you heat it. And this takes minimal heat to, for the polymer clay. So my reasons, like I said, I always wanted to express myself. Then I lived for a long time. I lived 10 years. Well, even previous to that, all of my friends, ever since I've been single, all of my friends were musicians. And they would, they wrote ballads about things that was happening in their life. And I am not a very good musician. So I always wanted to uh, express myself that way. So, and I had lived so many things and knew so many things from knowing my grandmothers and how they did things. And I wanted to pass that along to my children and other young people because I thought they might need to know those things in case, in, in case the world goes quit and they have to do it again. So they need to know this can be done. You know, it's a lot of work, but they could do it. So I started making things just to sort of illustrate to them how, how you do these things. And so, you know, but what I discovered is young people are very busy making their own history that their grandchildren are not going to be very interested in. <laughs> So, but, you know, also I am an environmentalist and I um, don't like plastic. But polymer clay is very plastic. So then I had this big dilemma, you know, artists always want to make their artwork out of something that's going to last a long time, but then, you know, it's plastic. But, you know, the artist won, the environmentalist didn't. So I have all this stuff for the future made out of plastic. So I, I, I hope it don't end up choking fish or anything. It was funny. But, yeah, so... All my stuff is made to communicate. Uh, sometimes, um, well, like the ballad singers, like the people that write songs about this, it's kind of mine. Sometimes it's politics, and, and, and sometimes it's just my opinions or my humor and some of them. Um, and I... You know, I do worry about young people and what is going to happen to them and what they don't know about how they can get their food and things if all of a sudden there's nothing coming in, being shipped in, you know. Um, so, let's see. Every one I did, every piece that I did, I am self-taught, and I had to learn to use this stuff myself. That's a many, many, many ways to use polymer clay. And, but none of them are the way I do it because I figured it out myself, how, how I've done it. And I would be glad to show anybody that would, would like to know uh, how to do it. I have made things for, and sold things to people for dollhouse furniture and things like that to show them how to make them. Um, but I had a lot of fun because everything was a challenge. So it was a challenge for me to think up a story and what I wanted to put in it and then figure out how, how to make that. How am I going to make a poker? Uh, how am I how am I going to make that pot-bellied stove and things like that? Uh, and it was just a triumph when I would figure out how to do it, and I just think, <laughs> got that one, <laughs> you know. So I just quietly by myself enjoying myself with my own little triumphs. So that's pretty much the story of my work. That's it.